Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Temple Grandin. Dr. Grandin is a professor, an inventor, a best-selling author, and a star in two important fields, animal science and autism education. At the age of two, Dr. Grandin was diagnosed with autism. With in intense support and tutoring, she began speaking at four. This was in spite of the fact that her parents were, were told there is no hope and maybe she should be institutionalized. She later went on to earn a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master and doctoral degrees in animal science. Her experience with autism leads her to see the world in pictures, much the same way as she believes, and most of us concur, animals see the world. As a re result, she has made enormous impact on animal welfare. Her greatest achievements have been in changing the way cattle are held and processed. Today, more than half the cattle in the US and Canada are handled in equipment based upon her findings and designs. She's also an advocate for children diagnosed with autism and other special needs. She has spoken internationally to children, parents, educators, and scientists about her personal story and insights. She has written several books and received numerous awards and honors. In 2010, the film, Temple Grandin, about Dr. Grandin's life, won several award, awards, including both a Golden Globe Award and an Emmy Award. Dr. Grandin is now a professor of animal science at Colorado State University, and she demonstrates to us regularly the commitment necessary to succeed in life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Grandin. It's great to be here. Got lots of things to talk about, a short period of time tonight. And one of the things that really helped me when I was a little kid is my ability in art was always encouraged. You know, kids that get these different labels, they have uneven skills. Well, you can get a kid labeled with autism or something like that, or dyslexia, and uh, you gotta build up on what the kid can do. We get too much emphasis in education on what they're not able to do. And I go out into the cattle industry, and there's all kinds of people that have been labeled dyslexic, uh, ADHD, you know, some, a whole bunch of things like this. And some of them are running some pretty big companies. But I get worried today where some of these kids might be going. I want to give you some insight into how different minds can think about things differently. Now, when does normal variation become an abnormality? When does a little bit of moodiness become uh, bipolar? Uh, there's a lot of famous uh, people that have a uh, little bit of that trait, and you get a famous writer. People with autism get a lot more people in technical careers. There's no black and white dividing line between normal and abnormal. I want to emphasize, we can't get locked into these labels. You know, I was talking to a parent this morning, and she was going, well, my daughter's got executive function problems. I don't know, what do you mean by that? You know, let me find out what she can do. Let's, okay, reading level. USA Today, Wall Street Journal, could you read that? Tell me what's in an article. That's sort of basic reading level. What can they do? Now, I get worried about what would happen to little Albert Einstein today. Little Albert, no language till age three. Threw lots of temper tantrums. Like to do a lot of solitary play. He'd be labeled autistic in a lot of schools today. How about little Stevie here? This weird loner, he brought snakes to school and he turned them loose. So I like to liven up the classroom. He got bullied and teased when he was in high school. I was bullied and teased in high school. They used to call me Bones and Workhorse. When I was 15, I was cleaning eight horse stalls every day. One of the things I've learned from that is I learned working skills. I'm seeing too many kids today not learning working skills. Now another person I need to add to this is how about Beethoven? There's a new book out right now on Beethoven. 
and he had a lot of, you know, weird traits. See, the problem you've got with a diagnosis like autism is at one end of the spectrum, you've got guys like little Albert here, and at the other end of the spectrum, you've got somebody with much more severe handicaps. Maybe they're nonverbal, can't talk, can't dress themselves. It's a very, very big spectrum. But people tend to get locked into the labels. I can go out to Silicon Valley, I've been there. Been to Google, been to Microsoft, I've been to Disney Imagineering. Oh, and I even got to see the secret rides. I can't tell you about the secret rides. <laughs> uh, it's something I can't tell you about, very cool. Got to see the workshops and things. Lots of creative people working here. And I talked to some human resources people out in Silicon Valley. And they go, oh, we know half our programmers are Asperger's or mild autism, but we don't talk about it. So what ends up happening, kids that we used to just call the geeks and the nerds when I was in school, I went to kids that did the school with kids I know were on the spectrum. One of them owns a really big business today. Now, you need to be looking at some of these personality traits sort of like a music mixing board. These are continuous traits. It's not black and white, autistic or not autistic, or maybe a little bipolar or not bipolar. It is a continuous kind of a trait. You see, a little bit of this trait can give you an advantage. Too much of the trait, and you've got a very definitely got a big handicap. Now, I'm a visual thinker. Everything I think about is like a picture in my mind. And when I was a young kid, I used to think everybody thought in pictures like me. I didn't know that my thinking was different. And being a visual thinker helped me in work with designing livestock facilities. In fact, the piece of equipment that half the cattle go in, center track restrainer system. If you want to see how that works, you can look up beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin. And there are some of my drawings. Oh, good, we got a good projector this time. <laughs> when you're a weird geek and you don't interview well, you got to show off your portfolio. I sold jobs by showing off my skills. Let my work sell itself. You know, you need, people need to get a lot more into making portfolios. Yeah, you get the resume, but then show me what you really can do. And I have worked for um, 20 years. I've designed things. Then you got to go in the meatpacking plant, supervise the construction to make sure they build things right. You know, basically working in the construction industry. And I think one of the things that does is it teaches resourcefulness. You got to figure out how to do things. Another big concern I've got today is a lot of students sort of are floundering around. They don't know what they want to do. And I think this gets back to not, get, not seeing enough stuff as kids. Because I gave this talk up at Michigan State University, and I was asked to guest lecture in an environment class. It was one of these kind of general studies courses. You get a sophomore, it's going to fulfill the science requirements, so they take this class, don't know what they want to do. And I was in this class, and they give me all these cards with all these questions. And the number one question was, well, how did you find your passion? How did you get interested in the livestock industry? I was exposed to it at age 15. That might have a lot to do with it. <laughs> if I had not gone to my aunt's ranch when I was 15, I wouldn't have gotten involved with cattle. And I had an interesting discussion today down the meat slab. And they brought some middle school kids into the meat slab. And it was so cool to hold a big primal cut of meat like this. You mean, that's how meat starts out? You know, just things like that. They don't know where it comes from. And they're going, oh, this is interesting. They, they wanted to play a game how long they could stay in the freezer. <laughs> um, but the thing that we got to figure out is what's chores, maybe to somebody in the cattle industry, that's interesting to the public. But I think a lot of kids today aren't seeing enough different kinds of things. And I went out to my aunt's ranch when I was 15, and I was afraid to go. Mother gave me a choice. I could go for all summer or stay for a week. I got out there, and I loved it, stayed all summer. Now, I used to joke around that I had a huge graphic circuit for visual thinking. Turns out that I do have a huge graphic circuit, probably in about the top 25%, though there is an art professor that's got a bigger one that's been scanned. <laughs> He's got a PhD in art. And there's a circuit for um, speak what you hear. I'm not very good on the, on the auditory learning. Now, that's a circuit for speak what you see. It goes from the visual cortex up to the language cortex. That's a normal one. Now, there's mine. Mine's got a lot of extra branches. And if you want to see the coolest one, it's in USA Today. 
They gave USDA today the better slides than I got. <laughs> and all those branches you can see there, they've been truncated and cut off, but those go all over the brain. So now the circuit for speak what you see has got connections all over the brain. So I put key words into my mind, I instantly get pictures. I kind of got a, like a Google for images in my head. And that's how I think. Now I pay a price for that, because if you count the fibers, I've got less bandwidth for speak what you see. I had a speech delay, because I had less bandwidth. You see, there's always trade-offs. No, you get one thing, you lose something else. But the thing, you gotta look at this. If you were to go out and scan 100 people, at what point is an extra branch abnormal? This is gonna be a continuous trait. You know, this isn't something like, okay, you look at the scan, big hole in the brain or something like that. Yeah, that's totally abnormal. But things like this tend to be much more continuous traits. All right, now we're gonna get into a little abnormal. We got some things in there that are like the deep blue sea, it's full of water. I've got an asymmetry there, trashed out the math department. <laughs> Just trashed it out. And then you get into the whole discussion about innate ability versus learning. Where innate ability, I think, makes the most difference is extreme ability and extreme disability. Plasticity, you got a big area here in the middle where you can move things around. And fortunately, the only way I managed to get through college was back in 66 and 67, finite math was the required class, not algebra. Finite math was probability, statistics, and matrices. And with a bunch of tutoring, I could do it. Right now, we're in this algebra craziness. <laughs> well, I'm not suggesting giving up math. They kept beating away on algebra, and I never got to take uh, geometry. Why is algebra the prerequisite for geometry when the Greeks invented geometry first? <laughs> I sort of don't understand that. Yeah. But what I'm getting worried about is I'm getting worried some real, you know, that some of the visual thinkers are going to get screened out. I'm going to be showing you some reasons why you need us visual thinkers. Back in 68, Bill Gates and I had access to this, the state-of-the-art IBM reel-to-reel -reel computer teletype terminal. I wanted to do programming. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. You know, the field that I work in is industrial design. You know, you're using your visual thinking to design things. Yep, Bill Gates did computer programming. I couldn't do it. This is where I don't agree with Malcolm Gladwell. Gladwell says if you have enough education and enough access to services, you can do it. I had both of those things. Couldn't do it. Here's one of the most important slides. I'm a photorealistic object visualizer. Everything I think about is a picture. No picture, no thinking. And then you have another kind of thinker. This is the pattern thinker. That's the mathematician mind. Patterns. See, in your brain, you got circuits for what is something. That's my brain. And then you got circuits in your brain for where are you located in space. That's the mathematics mind. You might get a little third grader. Well, and they want everybody to be the same, so they don't let the third grader do the college math book, and now he turns into a behavior problem. Yeah, let him go ahead and do the college math book, but he's going to need special ed and reading. That tends to be the pattern. Then you got other people that are verbalizers. You see, I'm finding now, I'm realizing over the years, that having been involved in a career where you design something and then you build it, it's all about an outcome. You've got to make a project work. Construction industry is all about outcomes. You've got to get things done. Well, what's a good outcome in education? You get out, you have a good career that you like. Stay out of trouble with the law, don't go to jail, and certainly don't end up playing video games on Social Security. And <laughs> I'm seeing too much of that because I'm seeing too many kids where they're not learning how to shake hands. They aren't learning basic social skills, like shopping. I mean, come on now. Now, we gotta have evidence based today. So you might say to me, well, that's a bunch of rubbish. That's not really right that there really is different kinds of thinking. Well, here are the scientific studies that show that uh, this is right. This is in my brain book. It's called The Autistic Brain, and I got the evidence based for the different kinds of minds. And now I'm going to show you how the different kinds of minds can work together. OK, mathematics and algebra fanatics, I'm going to show you why you need my kind of mind after, after I explain that there's a verbal way to do the algebra and the more visual spatial way. And just to give you a glimpse into the mind of the mathematician, 
This praying mantis is made out of a single sheet of folded paper. No cuts, no tape. What you see in the background, that's the folding pattern, not my mind. There are some other cool origami things. I always like to show drawings off because when you're a weird geek, you've got to sell your work. And this is a really beautiful bridge drawing that a lady that's more at the moderate level made. Now, I want to emphasize, abilities have to be developed. And when I was in third and fourth grade, that's when my art ability started to show up, I wanted to just draw the same horse head over and over again. You've got to encourage the kid to do lots of different things. Take that fixation on horse heads and broaden it out. Well, let's do the entire horse. Let's draw it stable. Let's draw where you ride the horse, too. Make an associate of length. Because Jesse Parks now is selling her artwork commercially, but she had to get onto subjects like houses and bridges because before she drew electric blanket controls. <laughs> That's not exactly something that people want. <laughs> and here's some more gorgeous artwork. It's a guy named Grant Marnier here in Texas, the eco artist. About two years ago, I looked at his art and I said, you need to show professionally. Get out of the autism silo and go to a professional art show. Now he's selling professionally. You know what? He's getting more social because he's gotten out and he's had to talk to people. People ask me, well, how did you get good at public speaking? Because I did it. <laughs> Let me tell you a little secret. When I was in graduate school and I did my first talk, I panicked and walked out. Yep, that actually happened. All right, now we're going to get back to why all the mathematician fanatics need to have us visual thinkers. Here's a nice mess here. You don't want to get near this. This is the remains of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. And I like to read on planes. So I could get all these papers, I got all these business magazines. And I was reading them, and when I found out, after reading all of this stuff, why Fukushima melted down, I'm going, how could they do this? How could they have made this mistake? A mistake so basic. I can't design a nuclear reactor. But if I had been drawing up the concrete work for the foundation of this plant, and I'm perfectly capable of doing that, I go, wait a minute. We are by the sea, and all the emergency generators and emergency equipment is in a non-waterproof basement. I'm not kidding. The basement flooded. That's why three or four nuclear reactors melted down. All he would have had to have done to stop this Watertight doors, crank them shut, you know, like on a submarine. Simple things. Oh, I could have called up some shipbuilding companies and gotten those. Real simple thing. And you had this big mess. And then they made a bunch of other mistakes, like not, not asking for help. But the original thing is, no watertight doors. Now, there's been people that have discussed, well, you know, maybe some things in, in school are worthless, like, you know, one governor of a state, not Texas, I will not mention what state it was, he wanted to have the state university charge more money for a humanities major than for an engineering major, because humanities majors weren't worth anything. That was two years ago. We won't say what's, we won't embarrass the state. Well, Steve Jobs was an artist. He wasn't an engineer. You see, when you make something like the iPhone, every time you take out that iPhone or, or the, all the copies, the Samsung, and oh yeah, they're suing each other over that. Uh, Steve didn't, um, uh, wanted to go thermonuclear on Samsung. Well, when you look at your smartphone, an artist made that interface, not an engineer, an artist. Then the engineers had to make the insides work. In fact, when Steve Jobs showed off the very, very first cell phone, very first smartphone, it hardly barely worked. He had to practice the order of how he demonstrated it so it wouldn't freeze during the demonstration. Well, I think this is interesting. It was in the Chronicle of Higher Education. The connection between Steve Jobs and so-called useless humanity programs such as calligraphy should not be ignored. This also brings up the whole idea of busting out of silos. I like doing some cattle talks. I like doing uh, some autism talks. I like doing general kind of talks. We go out to Silicon Valley, see what's going on out there. Maybe go to a gifted conference, seeing little geeky, nerdy kids going down a good path there. You know, it's... it's yeah, coming out of the construction trades, it's all about outcomes. And I'm seeing too many kids playing video games on, you know, getting a disability check to play video games. Uh-uh. Need to be programming, programming games, not just playing them all day. Now, the thing is, you read the really good literature, it actually helps you on social skills. 
Not the junk they have at the airport, the good stuff. All right, the very first work I ever did with livestock, I noticed that animals saw visual detail. And I kind of blew my mind that other people didn't notice it. Oh, they'd spook at a chain hanging down. They'd spook at a shadow. They'd spook at a car parked next to a corral. Uh, little things we tended not to notice. And I go, why don't other people notice that? All right, how many people noticed how that animal's locked onto that sunbeam like radar? Yeah, visual detail. That's what they're all about. I'm always getting nasty. They're scared of getting slaughtered. And they behave the same way at the slaughterhouse as they do on the ranch. Then you got to look at things like, what are the ears doing? Horse and the zebra have an ear on each other, and then he got an ear on me. Watch those things. What's, okay, most of my students will point out that there's a chain hanging down there at the slaughter plant, but they don't see the three people standing where they should not be standing. Yes, like obvious, like it's not a good idea to put your emergency equipment in a non-waterproof basement. You know, the thing is, sometimes the most obvious is the least obvious. And why, would, why do the mathematicians not see it? You know what I'm finding? It's not stupidity. It's different kinds of minds. The mathematics mind doesn't see it. Now, there's some evidence that language covers up things like visual thinking, because there's a type of Alzheimer's. And as the um, language gets wrecked, art comes out. And when Van Gogh was painting Starry Night, some statisticians got a hold of this and found out he was putting some mathematics into Starry Night. I think that's kind of cool. Now, my thinking's bottom up. Most people think top down. You make a hypothesis, you try to cram all the data into it. The normal mind tends to overgeneralize. So the kid gets a label like dyslexia or autism, and they go, oh, can't, totally handicapped. Well, I don't, I, I, I have the point, I don't really care what the label is. All right, let's find out what he can do. What is he good at? Where does he have a problem? You know, let's look at where the problem is. I don't care if you're troubleshooting a behavior problem or, or a problem with a student. Where's the problem? Don't overgeneralize. Everything is learned by specific examples. See, I'm a bottom-up thinker. Understand something in the future, I've got to compare it back to knowledge in my database. You've got to get these kids out and get them doing stuff. You know, too many kids today are becoming recluses in their room. Uh-uh. OK, I want to teach something simple like this, like position words. Well, you got to learn that this position word down, it applies to many different kinds of situations, as I show here on this slide. Got to show the different situations. Also, my thinking's associative. I just went to a creativity seminar at the American Psychological Association in Washington, D.C. I was just there last week. And they were talking about creative people, you know, they can think up more creative uses for brick than throwing it through a window. And I actually got that. Um, that test from my science teacher, Mr. Carlock, my great science teacher, got me interested in studying. You know what he thought up for creative uses of a brick? You can cut it, up, cut it up into little tiny cubes and paint dots on it and have 200 brick dice. I thought that was pretty clever. <laughs> so, when I think about airports, you know, like, in, you know, associative, okay, start thinking about airports. Now, when I see that airport, I can go in a glass structure category and start surfing Google for images in my mind, or I can go in an airport category. There's no generalized pictures. About 25 years ago, I was shocked to learn that if I said church steeple, some people got this vague generalized thing. I don't have any vague generalized thing. I just see specific ones, glass structures, the biosphere, Crystal Palace, our greenhouse. And how about airport category? Denver Airport. And while we're looking at things like airports, I like when I try to when I cost things, I think about, well, when I hear the government spending about some big amount of money, it costs five billion to build this airport. That's called DIA units, Denver Airport, International Airport Units. I think we need to be getting some of this stuff back to real things. Five billion dollars. I found out that the stimulus money in 2008 was equal to two Denver airports for every state. That includes all the land, water, electrical, everything except airplanes and vehicles. Okay, Dallas, Minneapolis, Atlanta. I was down there when they had that snowstorm. That was a big joke. Oh, man. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Two inches of snow and the governor's telling every trucker to stay out of the state of Georgia. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was there. Yeah, my flight left without me. 
And then you got good old the garbage, and it's living up to its... Uh, United's got the worst gate on the whole concourse. You've got to tow the plane into this dreadful gate. Now, when I asked an astrophysicist about church staples, he saw a motion of people kind of singing and praying. He saw motion and patterns. Like, oh, wow, trippy. This guy worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, the thing about cattle and animals is they're specific in how they think. So if you train the cattle to be nice and gentle and tame to the man on horse, First time they see a man on foot, they get scared and run away. But think about it. A man on a horse is a different picture than a man on the ground. Now, I find that a lot of people don't do enough question asking when they troubleshoot things. We try to overgeneralize. And one of the, I, I find this all the time. If I got a problem with the equipment or something wrong with how the people run the equipment, or if I got a kid with a problem, do you have a biological problem, like maybe he's got stomach ulcers or something like that? Or is it just a behavior problem? Top-down thinking, you tend to overgeneralize. Boy, I can tell you, education is the worst on this. Education is just going through so many crazy fads. We fight over things like, should you teach phonics or should you teach whole word? You know, you teach both. Some kids learn different ways. Well, a bare minimum outcome for reading is if I give you the Wall Street Journal and I say, read this article, can you tell me something about this article? And if you can't, well, then you can't read, and that's at the sixth grade level. Wall Street Journal and USA Today are sixth grade level reading. You better be able to read that. The other thing that I find on getting out there and finding jobs, a lot of, I had to do back doors. Kids interview badly, so you got to figure out how to get them in the back doors. I just heard about a FedEx driver that went to work on an oil rig, and now he's their head fracker two years later. A FedEx driver? Now, you got some industries out there where there's all kinds of opportunity, but people just don't realize it. Well, we need to get a lot more of the people that make policy having to use the results of their policy. So when you dog food something, that's a programming term, programmer has to use the phone or whatever it is that's got his crappy code in it. He's going to find out how bad it is. That's what policymakers need to do. I'd like to do a show called Undercover Legislature. <laughs> and I got this real special trailer all set up just for you. <laughs> and we're going to drop you off with a, um, you got your, your wallet, and we're going to give you a Visa card, debit card, $50 on it. You've got a card with this much gas in it, and your Walmart pin is in the trailer. You're important to work tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Check stand. And we're gonna, you've got to find out a lot of things doing that. <laughs> now, here are, here are the um, people that put the Mars rover on Mars. Well, you look at the guy there with the long hair. He was a theater major. I'm getting really concerned about, you know, schools have taken out so many different career things like art, music, theater, uh, welding, automobile shop. We have a shortage right now in this country of certified welders and um, auto mechanics and diesel mechanics. You know, there's, there's going to be great jobs for some kids. But, you know, to get kids turned on to things that be great jobs, we've got to expose them in middle school. And they go, oh, no, health and safety, we can't take them in the meat slab. Now, I agree, I wouldn't let them handle the knives. But, okay, they get to pull the string that opens the door and um, hold some big chunks of meat and go find out how cold the freezer is. I mean, that's stuff that you can do safely. And, you know, it gets kids turned on. You know, because if you don't show kids interesting stuff, they don't get interested in interesting stuff. And after I did that talk up at Michigan State, in this class where some of these undergraduates are kind of just floating around not knowing what they wanted to do, realized how important it was to get, you know, the, the, okay, I got exposed to the cattle industry at age 15. Wouldn't be in the cattle industry if I hadn't been exposed to it. Now, some brain scan research showed I was more interested in looking at things and looking at people. But we need people in this world interested in things. Tesla, who invented the power plant, would definitely be labeled autistic today. Now, one of the things you got to do to help the kids that are different, that have these labels, and I'm talking especially, you know, one of the things I find is a problem. Teachers have a hard time shifting gears lots of times between somebody nonverbal with some very severe handicaps from somebody that's uh, just kind of geeky and awkward socially. you got to stretch these kids. I'm seeing too much coddling, too much helicopter parents. I'm at a meeting. The 10-year-old walks up, and he doesn't know how to shake hands. 
Also, instead of telling me about that he likes to show cattle or something like that, all he wants to do is talk about his autism. They're getting way too much into their handicap. When I was 10 years old, I was too busy and you know experimenting with kites. And when I was seven and eight years old, I was experimenting with bird kites behind my trike. Nice wings with little wingtips, just like a commercial jet's got. I made those when I was seven and eight years old. And I experimented for hours, taping the wings of different amounts of adhesive tape to get it to fly right. That's the kind of stuff I was interested in. No, I don't, autism's important for who I am, but it's secondary. In fact, now at this stage in my career, you know, some people say, why don't you just let autism just take over? I go, no. I think it's important that I still have a real job. And what I've been spending a lot of time on is teaching a lot of short courses. I was just in Germany uh, working for McDonald's, teaching a short course on humane slaughter methods. I was in China doing the same thing. I'm a PACO instructor. I don't even get paid to do PACO instructor. That's professional animal auditor. I, because let's get, let, uh, get students exposed to different things. You know, I had a great mentor when I was in college. I, the other thing is kids have got to learn work skills, and this needs to start at 12 with paper routes. If we don't have paper routes, I know we don't have them anymore. How about walking dogs to the neighbors? How about something like setting up ch uh, chairs in the church every Sunday? Eight-year-olds can be church ushers. You know, we got to get them out, away from the home, get them learning some of these skills. Kids aren't doing free play. Well, and free play teaches resourcefulness. I had a fascinating discussion when I went out to visit the uh, jet propulsion lab. Um, I had a lady pick me up at the airport, and she had a walnut farm, and she'd have 11-year-olds, 10-year-olds come out and camp out in the walnut, walnut orchard, and we'd take away all their electronics. And she said an interesting thing happened. For two days, they mope around like in a drug withdrawal for video games. <laughs> then a switch flips, and they start to do free play. And they find out free play is fun. It's fun to climb trees and do stuff like that. Well, taking out the hands-on classes is the worst things the schools ever did. You know, they, you know when I, was, I remember doing a sewing project, and I cut the fabric wrong. Well, I wrecked that project. Another project, you might make a mistake, and then you've got to figure out how to fix your mistake. Well, those are the things that saved me. If I hadn't had these kind of activities in high school, I would have gone absolutely nowhere. And when I was in high school, and I wasn't doing all that much studying, I was doing lots of building things, like making our Skeeto house really nice. And I've realized just in the last year how much building things has affected how I approach problems. Because when you build something, you got to figure out how to do it, then you got to do it. It's all about outcomes. You got to get the project done, you've got to make it work. Well, grad new graduates, let's go out and do some real stuff. I was kind of horrified to read about a book review of a book that just came out that, you know, in some of our elite universities, the main thing the students want to do is like go into like Goldman Sachs or something like that. And, you know, then the financial industry spends $20 million on a fiber optics cable to game up the um, commodities market. You know what? That's not what our best and our brightest should be doing. I'm a child of the 50s, man. Boy, we built the interstate highway system. I did it right next to my house. Really cool. 60s, we went to the moon. We did stuff. I think we need to be getting more about getting out and making things and doing real stuff. Things that's going to make you know, society a better place, but not in theory. I'm not into theory. You know, if you're going to be a policymaker, we've got too many people become policymakers. Well, they've never dog-fooded the stuff that they're making policy about. So all you graduates out there, let's go out there and do some real stuff that's going to really make a difference. <laughs>